Hi, everybody. Uh, this is, I'm Lenore Von Stein. This is another episode of The Facts. And uh, tonight we're, we're going to be, we're going to talk, you know, different kinds of episodes on the facts, discussion and, and music. And tonight it's, we're going to discuss um, the effects of rape. And um, with me tonight are, um, at the far side of the table, Erin uh, Gallagher. Uh, she's with Physicians for Human Rights. Uh, she works with, uh, in conflict zones with, with victims of, of of war, and including rape, and she's the director of investigations, and she's a war crimes investigator. And next to her is sitting Esther Deblinger. Uh, she's a professor of, uh, of psychiatry at uh, Rowan University and, um, and the co-director of CARES, which means Child Abuse Research, Education, and Services, dealing mostly with uh, child victims of uh, sexual assault. And, um, and over here uh, is Meredith Weber, who is um, a clinical uh, assistant professor of school psychology uh, at Temple University and um, a, trauma, a trauma therapist. Um, and so, okay, could you start us off by uh, give, give us some of the definitions of what, what, is, what is considered sexual assault? Um, not, you know, it should be self-evident, right? But um, I, 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 you know, if I'm watching the wrong news show, it apparently is not. Uh, so, what, 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 what is, what are the definitions? Legal, medical. What are the definitions? Can you give me some? Sure. Starting with the legal definition, it would be um, when a victim is penetrated, um, even the, by the slightest amount. Um, with the with the penis. Now it, it it also can be broadened where it involves other acts of sexual violence, um, such as oral copulation or um, penetration of anal as well as genitals. Um, so it, it it can be a broader definition, usually used internationally, and without the consent of the victim. So coercion, force, violence, duress, fear um, is is used as part of the assault. I think with children, it's important to acknowledge that they cannot really give consent to an age-inappropriate sexual activity. So it, it really broadens to, to most any um, adult-child sexual interaction um, would be considered sexual abuse of a child. Uh-huh. OK. So, so, so what, what are some of the effects of of this violence on a person's ability post. You know, there seems to be, is, is there a difference, or what are the kinds of difference between assault, regular, old, ordinary, horrible assault, hit you on the head assault, and uh, sexual assault of sorts in terms of the victim's reaction, the victim's need for care, the, the uh, you know, the, you hear all the uh, rape is a terrible thing. Why is it a terrible thing? I mean, I, I, I I certainly feel that it's a terrible thing, but I'd like to delineate a little more for the audience. Why? Why? Is it, is it, does it have something to do with the long-term effects? I think even in the short term, sexual assault may be different from physical assault in the shame that it carries with it. And that shame actually has been documented to lead to the long-term effects of sexual abuse. People don't understand why 20 years later, an individual may still be suffering the effects of something that happened to them sometimes as a child. And a lot of um, clinicians as well as researchers have looked at the impact from the standpoint of not only ongoing symptoms of something like post-traumatic stress that a lot of war veterans suffer, but many victims of rape suffer as well. But they also recognize that there's a certain shame that people carry with them that they cannot necessarily rid themselves of even many, many years after the assault. I think also when we're talking about children, it's important to remember they're still developing. So when something this intimate happens to them while they're developing their identities and their ideas about relationships and trust, it can really fracture attachments and it can really inform their sense of um, relationships with others and who they are, what, their sec what healthy sexuality should or shouldn't be, what... Um, relationships with adults or with older children should and shouldn't be. So I think there's also a lot um, sort of outside just what we think of as the clinical symptoms mm -hmm. of PTSD that can happen when you're still in this process of development. 
One of the things we were talking about before the camera's roll was was that for many people, children and adults, the the rapist, uh, aside from war issues, the rapist is often somebody they know very well. Yeah. Uh, so there's this this profound betrayal that mm -hmm. uh, is added to this cup of shame and and um, fear and 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 how do you deal with something like that? Very difficult. <laughs> Um, I think, you know, one of the reasons why it's difficult to detect sexual abuse is because it is uh, perpetrated often by someone that other people trust as well, not only the, the child. Um, and it's hard to believe that someone who functions very well, for example, in the workplace would abuse a child. But that is the case. And in fact, the vast majority of children are sexually abused by someone they know and someone they trust. Why do people sexually abuse? Is there a link between having been sexually abused and sexually abusing later on in life? The majority of sexual abuse survivors do not go on to abuse other people in that way. However, it can be a red flag for a child, especially when they're doing something sexually inappropriate, that they themselves are touched inappropriately. So ideally, you can intervene early enough if you see a child acting in a way that's inappropriate and really help educate them about what is and is not appropriate and help them learn new ways of relating. If that does not get corrected, it could lead to bigger problems later on in terms of acting out sexually. How do children know that they've been sexually abused? I mean, I mean, I mean there's some obvious ones. They get physically hurt or, you know, um, but they just know because of the culture uh, tells them or, or that is a great question, because very young children often don't know. Um, they haven't yet learned that certain kinds of touching is OK, and other kinds of touching between an adult and child is not OK. And um, it is very confusing for very young children. And one of the things I think is very important for us to do is to help children better understand, starting at the age of three, what child sexual abuse is, so that they can report it when something like that happens. No, I've also, I've worked with cases where there's been chronic sexual abuse and sort of what you were speaking to, it becomes part of family life and if someone is either isolated enough that they don't understand that that's, that's not a normal part of family life, it can be confusing. So I've seen cases where it may go on for a while because a child just doesn't realize that's not part of a typical relationship, you know, between child and parent or child and adult. And if I could jump in in some of the cases that I've had of um, sexual child abuse, that they, right, it became that they thought it was something kind of normal. It was with, a, uh, with a, a, a father, an uncle, some member of the family. Yet at the same time, they knew down deep that it something wasn't OK. And right. certainly, they didn't speak about it to other members of the family, which is kind of a, a, a signal like that they knew there was something, something not right about it. Um, but once again, very confusing. And then yeah. maybe it gets to a place where it's severe enough they're becoming older, they are understanding now that it isn't part of normal family life and that they might disclose, tell this to somebody, and then then the report happens and it, it, it starts. I remember a, a, a childhood friend of mine who had been abused regularly by her father um, telling me when I was pretty young and I, I, I just didn't know what to do for her. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I still feel very guilty about that. Um, and, but later on in life as an adult, she did uh, bring this up. And I, one of the reasons it seemed clear that she didn't bring it up before is that she didn't expect any support from the other members of her family, including her mother, and, and she didn't get it. You know, as an adult, she, she didn't get it. They, they, is this, what, what is this? Is this a cultural thing? Is this a? Well, I, I think it's important to emphasize that though that, that does happen on occasion in a family where it's very difficult for the mother to understand and, and believe. In, in our experience, the vast majority of mothers do support their children when children disclose. It's, it is still a shocking thing for any family member. You don't expect it to happen within the family. You don't expect your next door neighbor mm -hmm. to sexually abuse your child. It usually is someone that the adult also trusts and believes has no desire to harm the child. So it, it is, it's very much a shock, yet we all need to be prepared to 
hear these disclosures because it happens to one out of four girls and almost one out of seven boys by the time children are 18 years of age. So it's much more prevalent than people realize. And I think what can be confusing for adults, too, is that it, it's not necessarily the case that a child then hates their perpetrator. They may have a very good relationship with their assailant, who's also hurting them in the specific way, but they may not uh, be repelled from this person. It may be an uncle that they're very fond of and who treats them very nicely otherwise. So I don't think children always act in the way adults expect they might act when they're being abused. I think that's, yeah, one of the, the most difficult and confusing aspects for a child is that they also love this person, whether it's a parent or another family member, yet they also know they're being harmed by it. And what a, what a con conflict, you know, a child must feel growing up with that. What a feeling you must have with the person that not only that you love, but that you, that you expect loves you. <laughs> you know, you know, respect, you know, cares for you is, is, is on your team, you know, to be so, to betray you so profoundly. Um, I know it, this wasn't on the agenda, but I'm wondering if anybody could speak to this. Why do people do this? Why do people sexually assault, aside from having been sexually assaulted? Do we know anything about why? Uh, why this happens, why you would do this to your child, why you would do this to, why in war situations you, that, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be a military tactic at this point, right? You'd go in and, and terrorize a population so that you can go take the next town or whatever it is, you know, easily, and they'll run away. Uh, so that's, as nasty as that is, that's very straightforward, right? But why... It's sort of like doing it to yourself if you do it to your kid in a way. It's sort of like hitting yourself. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe you don't see the child as yourself. Um, there's a small percentage of abusers that are what we'd consider pedophiles, people that have arousal towards, or they get sexually aroused by children. Um, but that's not the majority of people that do it. Um, there's a variety of different problems that cause people to abuse children. and. Um, you know, often we're talking about someone who's not a biological child. It could be like a step parent or another relative. Um, and access is a big um, issue for most people. So it's just sort of the, the children that are near them. And I've heard of people doing it out of um, anger. It's, you know, displaced anger, um, just other problems that they're having in their lives. Adult offenders often do have some history of abuse or neglect in childhood. It may not be sexual abuse. But it is uh, a childhood that is somewhat devoid of boundaries, um, models, uh, not having models of respect, not having a healthy family relationship. It's hard to know exactly why. And I have to admit that children ask this all the time in the course of therapy, why did this happen? And on one occasion, I tried to answer that question in a, in a way that was probably much too sophisticated and probably wasn't accurate, because we really don't know why people sexually abuse children. So when I realized this, this little girl wasn't understanding me and she was sort of fading out as I was trying to explain, I asked her, why do you think men sexually abuse children? And she said the simplest thing to me. She said, because they want to. <laughs> and I thought it a, for a very young child, keeping it simple, um, because we really don't know the answers. We really don't know the answers. And the one thing that we do know is it is, it is never the fault or responsibility of a child. That adults um, and older children know what is right and what is not right in terms of sexual behavior. And um, unfortunately, children don't always know that. Can we talk for a second about why it's used as such a, um, why it's so prevalent in war situations? and, and, and the, the invading army uh, hurting the people that, met, you know, that happen to live in that area, um, whether it's a st strategy or whether it's just leftover anger, leftover hatred, they're not people, uh, whatever it is. It's a, it's a variety of different reasons and, 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 and a variety of different scenarios. So it could be, you know, the army that's coming through, it's invading, it's searching for let's say, the men to take or to kill and raping the, 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 the women, the, the children, the girls in the homes. It can be also oftentimes what we're seeing in detention. So when 
Um, men and women have been arrested as, let's say, being part of the opposition, taken to prisons, detention centers, and they're um, being raped um, and, and, and many other means of sexual violence and torture used. There it can be used oftentimes for trying to get confessions, mm -hmm. for humiliation, for sending a message um, to the rest of the family, to that village, to the opposition. This is what we will do to you and your your women or your men or your boys and girls. Um, it's it's punishment, absolutely, um, for op for opposing them. Um, and in terms of the the home invasions, oftentimes it is humiliation. It is done in front of family members, in front of others. Um, it is it, once again sending a message. Um, not we can do this to your women or to your children, and you cannot do anything about it or protect it. Um, punishment, and sure, there are times where it is about opportunity, where it's a very insecure environment. There's always some different power dynamic. You have a military or a militia with weapons and civilians that don't. Usually the men either have fled or are fighting or have been taken away, so you have a more vulnerable population that's left with men coming in with weapons. Um, and. Um, it's it's a dynamic, unfortunately, that in, we've seen in, an, in many conflicts in recent years. Um, rape has become a part of it, whether that's in DRC, that's in Libya, that's in Syria, um, that was in Bosnia during the war, many different places. Um, and it's to, we see it predominantly to women and girls, but we're also seeing it happen to men and boys as well. So these, I, I work with, um, I, I teach in a, in a college where there are a lot of people post-military, in the military, post-military, going into the military. And one of my students, I, I know it's a little segue, but one of my students, one of the women students, um, asked if she could give a talk in the class about being raped in the military, which is not uncommon. And uh, not only was she raped, but her a gay friend of hers was raped, and they were both raped by by friends that they had gone out drinking with. Uh, and um, uh, so I said, OK, she gave this talk. It was, you know, <gasps> you know, and there are a lot of people in the military there who you think, well, I thought anyway, might have known a little bit more about this. But it, I, I bring this up because the, the you know, the military, prisons, uh, college campuses, um, uh, aside from the general population, one of the, the 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 word that sticks out to me is this this no, this humiliation issue this humiliating the victim um i mean assaulting somebody is um, humiliating them anyway you know controlling them in some way but this is, seems to be an extra added layer of mm -hmm. of telling them how little you think of them um how do people overcome that? I mean, we've been talking about it around that, but the, the humiliation of that experience. I think very much like your student did, by speaking mm -hmm. out about it, by not hiding, not keeping it a secret, not feeling that it's her shame, but actually by speaking out about it. And we, we don't encourage children to speak out about it, but we do actually encourage, in the course of therapy, children write about their experiences. And they share what they've written with the parent and with the therapist because it releases the shame. It helps them to understand that it wasn't about them. It was something that happened to them, but the experience wasn't about them. And I, I, you know, I, I admire that when a woman can speak out to a class because that not only is healing perhaps for her, but it also reduces the likelihood that this will happen to others. The more it's not a secret, the more we can protect children and um, potentially protect women and all people who are victims of sexual assault. And I think for a lot of people too, even just uh, hearing that it happens to other people, having a name to be able to put to their experience can be very empowering and sort of open the door to being able to share more and being able to sort of compartmentalize what happened. That's sort of what's happening now, right? Is it's 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 this 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 thing is coming out of the closet more and more. People are. Discussing this as a yes. part of the, part of the, part of the women's movement, part of just part yeah, of the yeah. movement for increased freedom, democracy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, um, 
that it's being discussed, but there really is a, a tremendous, um, uh, well, as always, kickback um, from the, what, from many established powers, from some that aren't so established yet, you know, in, 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 in uh, sort of, well, criminalizing sexuality, ergo, and then, you know, continuing that on into criminalizing, you know, the victims of somebody else's sexual aggression. One thing that seems to be happening on college campuses now, which I think is very positive, is that there had been a lot of what was considered like rape prevention that was really had a focus on the victim, not, not to go out and drink, to be very careful of your drink, et cetera, all of which might be good guidelines for health and safety, but they they really put the focus on the victim instead of focusing on the people committing the, these acts and, you know, working with them on what is and is not okay to do. And it seems like there's been a bit of a shift with that and mm -hmm. really working more with the people who might be doing these assaults on, let's use good judgment when you're out, let's use good judgment when you're drinking, et cetera. So I, I think that's a positive sign. How do you work with the families, with the, with the perpetrators of the... My understanding is that child sexual abuse, often the, the children go back to live with the abuser. It's, it's not always a... Well, in, not in our community. In um, many, many communities in uh, the United States, there is a strong push for prosecution of adult sex offenders. So um, there is an effort that when a child is healing and in, the, in counseling, that there shouldn't be contact with someone who sexually assaulted the child. Um, that, that is a change. Uh, but I think it's a very, very important one because it is such a secretive behavior that it is very difficult for a child to feel safe in the same home as someone who had sexually assaulted them. Can the, can the, can the assaulter be cured? That's a difficult question <laughs> to answer. I can say for uh, juveniles, because actually a great many of the children who touch other children inappropriately are older teens or pre-adolescents in the household, there's a very, very good success rate at helping them to not engage in those behaviors again. Overall, they may be engaging in other delinquent behaviors like, you know, shoplifting or robbery, but uh, I would say when they get out, about two-thirds of them really never have those issues again when they've been in consistent treatment with, you know, an adult is so important to, and, and someone who they live with really has to be involved in safety planning. So at least for, I can say, people under 18, there's a very good uh, success rate for treatment. Is it a kind of a bully thing, it's that they, they, out, they, they, can be, they can be treated to change their, these tactics, or maybe bully is the wrong word for it, these, these ways of controlling other people? They're, or is it, I mean, how do they, how do you fix them? Um, it it's sort of depends on who the child is, and it's pretty individualized, but a lot of it, um, it, it you know, helps them look at their actions, uh, at least in the model that I've used before, which is cognitive behavioral, and then also really understanding what their victim's experiences were and building empathy for their victim. Um, I've seen reunification cases where there may be two children in one household, and one is referred for acting out and one is the victim, and eventually through therapy and a lot of work, that eventually leads to them doing work together, they can reunite and they can live together again in the best case scenario. So, you know, what motivates the child that acted out really varies, but um, it's ultimately about behavior change and they can usually be successful. So what happens to all these soldiers when they, when the war's over? We hope that they get some, some therapy, some treatment. Um, I, th I think just like anyone experiencing the war, um, there's quite a bit of whether what side you're on. Um, there's, there is some sort of, I, I don't want to diagnose it as PTSD, but some sort of trauma that um, exists. And um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not an expert, but I, I, having spoken to you know, a number of people that have been in conflicts and returned home, um, they, they need it. Um, but as, as well as the victims, too. And that's one of the things that we've seen, especially in an international conflict. We, they don't have the luxury, often, of, of psychological services or psychosocial services or many times even medical services. Um, and they're still, a, depending on the culture, could be an, 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 an intense stigma and shame around reporting. So they are keeping it to themselves, having nobody to tell, mm -hmm. um, and dealing with it on their own. 
um, and with all the other effects of the war that they're struggling with. It's, it's a pretty big burden. So when you deal with these things on your own, if you do the opposite of, you know, talking mm -hmm. about it, what, what, what happens to you? I mean, what, what's the problem with dealing it, you know, the, I mean, like, as so many people do, as so many, you know, I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone, and mm -hmm. that's a, what's the, why is that a bad thing to do in terms of your own healing? Well, if you think about post-traumatic stress disorder, it's a disorder that um, causes symptoms, very, very disturbing symptoms. Your heart starts pounding, you aren't, are unable to sleep at times, you can't concentrate, and you have those symptoms oftentimes when you're reminded of the trauma, whatever it is. And when you think about both adults and children, there are reminders everywhere. There are reminders everywhere. And so it's really critical that people get effective treatment. And the good news is, is today, unlike maybe 25 years ago when there was really no effective tre treatment for childhood PTSD, there is effective treatment for both adults and children. It's just a matter of getting people to those effective therapies. Okay, we're, we're remarkably at the end of uh, the, the uh, t tying up the, the conversation. Um, I was in an accident once, and I had PTSD. I was in a pretty serious accident. And I used to, I, and I got a lot of treatment for it. And I, I used to think that the floor was going to go out from underneath me, and the and the uh, I was in an elevator that crashed, and that the and that mm. the, the the brakes on the car were going to suddenly mm. go. And I knew on one ha part of my head knew this wasn't true, but the other part of my head was really feeling it. So I do have a feeling, and every time I hear ambulances, for a long time, I you know I would, I. Would, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a long time ago, so it's, so here we go. So uh, this is the facts. I'm, I'm going to say right quickly, good night, and, and, and we'll be back with more um, conversation. Goodbye, everybody.